So thank you very much for that nice introduction. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really, really glad. This is my first speaking engagement of 2021. I'm really, really looking forward to it. I have very positive thoughts about Sweden because we are friends in Gothenburg and uh, I'm really, really connected to really, really nice thoughts. But uh, this is not about vacation uh, today. Um, in the next like 60 minutes and the next hour, we would like to look at Angular libraries. So in this talk, I would like to talk about how we can create Angular libraries, what kind of format they have, these Angular libraries, what can we do with them if we're starting, if we want to distribute them to like a package manager, like NPM and stuff. And basically at the end, how we can architect our Angular apps with libraries um, when we regard it uh, at, a, at a mono repo and want to build large Angular apps. Um, like said in the introduction, um, hi, I'm Fabian. I'm an Angular and uh, ASP.NET Core developer. So thank you once again for having me. I'm a Google developer expert as well as a Microsoft MVP. So if you have any questions about those programs, uh, if you want to, to get in or if you want to have more information, feel free to just drop me a line or contact me. And then we can, uh, of course, talk about that. It's absolutely no problem. So <clears throat> architecting Angular apps with libraries. Uh, if we think about libraries uh, in the Angular world, first of all, um, I would like to start with a question why we should do libraries, like in general, right? And I think uh, you all know that if you start your new Angular application, you have like um, your app component where you're starting with or any kind of component where you're starting with. And then it is all about separation. It's all about separation of concerns and dividing your Angular application into small parts, which you can maintain, which you can work with basically. So um, you're adding more and more components to your, to your application. So you have your first, your app component, and then you have like a list component, and then you have like a, a things footer or something. So you're adding things and your application grows and it grows and it grows. And all the kind of stuff you add in the future just brings more code to your application. And you're starting to think about how you can like divide it. You know, and the first thing what you're doing is you're taking all those components and maybe a service uh, where you get like your data from or who does, uh, um, which does some calculations and stuff and you pack it in a module, right? So this is like one of the um, logical separation systems Angular brings us with Angular modules basically. Um, and then you add a new feature to your application and then you separate that into another module, right? Which also has a component. And maybe you need the service, which you have like in the first module, um, you need that in the second module as well. So you have to think about separation. You have to think about the lowest common denominator where you put your, your service just to write it only once and test it only once and stuff. So what you do is you can um, introduce another module or another folder and you can just move the service in there. So you, you take it from the first module and you place it into that module uh, you just introduced or the folder if it's a service and then you can distribute uh, the service or the logic of the service into the other modules as well. So this is kind of like sharing knowledge inside of your application, right? You write only, um, you write the code only once, you can test it and you have it in particular at one place and you consume it by different places inside of your application. This works pretty well and um, it scales pretty well if you're working with one application. But just think about that you're working on an application and just uh, a service uh, a coworker comes to you and uh, he's like, hey, you got that nice logging library or a logging service. Can I just use that one? Can I use that logging service that you just had in your, in your application? And you're like, hmm, it's, it's, it's based on my application, right? I can't share it. I can't get, get it out of my application. So this works pretty well if we're just looking at one application. But if we're thinking about sharing code between different applications, right? this is exactly where libraries come into play. So if you want to share a service um, inside of your application with like other applications and build up like distributed knowledge at a separate point, uh, you can use libraries for that. And inside of that library, there can be like modules, there can be like services, like components, so everything you want to share. And from that library, you can share that logic to that specific apps. Uh, in this case, it's app one and app two, and it can be consumed by them. And then they can use the logic you just had in your services, modules, or whatever you encapsulate. 
So the first answer to the question, why are we doing uh, libraries is the reusability, of course. So you can reuse that code multiple times. You only have to write it once and um, you can use it from different points um, where you want to, right? You can just dive into it and use it. So the reusability is one of the big benefits if we are working with Angular libraries or with libraries in general. We have the don't repeat yourself principle. I will come to that uh, in the end of that talk, but don't repeat yourself. It's like you're only writing the logic once. You don't write it twice or multiple times. So even if it's, um, or uh, when it's, it, it's, it's like a lot of logic and you encapsulate that in the service and you provide that log logic to the outside world, you only have to write it once and you don't have to copy paste the code and maybe a lot of code um, just to maintain like two, two services or three services or how often you copy paste basically. Another reason is testing. So you can, um, let's take the uh, logger library we had, you can take that logger library and just uh, place it in a corner and consume it from there and you can test it um, that it does its thing. It does its thing really, really good and it's well tested and you can, uh, you can be sure that if there is a bug, um, it's most likely not in your library because it's all over tested and you can, if you pull something, some logic inside of your applications, you know, okay, this is 100% tested. It does its thing, it does its thing good. So basically this is also another advantage if we are working with libraries. The other thing is complexity. So when you have like a huge amount of logic inside of your app and you are getting it out of your application and you're sticking it into another place and consume it from there and it's well tested and you just see it like over an interface, we'll get to that um, over, over an API and you consume it from there. It reduces the complexity of your basic application which you're working on because you're getting rid of um, maybe a lot of files and maybe a lot of logic, right? And you do not care about it anymore because it, it's, it's consumed by a library and it's well tested and um, it's just sticking in another place and can be maintained in another place, right? So it reduces the complexity when you're looking um, at your specific app. If you're taking a step back, however, uh, the complexity raises a bit because if you're seeing what your application depends on, of course, there's one bubble more, like your library, which you're consuming right now. So um, if you're just looking through the glasses of your application, it, the, the complexity gets reduced. But if you're taking a step back, there's like one little bit more which gets consumed, which you have to keep in mind, which your application consists of basically, which, is, which it uses. So complexity is a two-way road in, in this case. So if we are building libraries or Angular libraries, um, there have to be a few requirements which should be fulfilled if we are building libraries which should be consumed by a lot of Angular application, maybe uh, in your company or something. So I would like to refer in the next few slides to a blog Minko Gechev wrote back in 2017, but it's still pretty accurate um, what he is doing or what he is um, telling us. So first of all, he's telling that the requirement for an Angular library should be, of course, it should be platform independent, right? Angular is platform agnostic. So we should like not refer to like a window object or something because we don't know if somebody who uses that library really has a window object, right? We don't know the circumstances. So it should be platform independent. Uh, independent. And Angular gives us abstractions of this, like with the renderer and renderer two, where we can abstract um, like um, access to, to those global objects, which we don't know if the consumer has, if he just takes in a library and want to use uh, our code. Of course, it should be bundled, right? Because I don't want to use all of your thousand files you just uh, distributed into that library. I want to have like an easy interface and I want to use like one file. I want to install it and I want to use it and it should be bundled, it should be as small as possible. I don't want it to blow up my application, right? So it should be bundled, of course. It should be ahead of time compatible. Um, so uh, there is a ahead of time um, compilation and your library should of course be ready for that. Angular uses this a lot. And uh, if your library doesn't support this, it would really, really not be a benefit for a library. So this is pretty much standard. And of course it should be type safe, right? We should use TypeScript um, for a building application, we should provide um, like types for it so that I have nice IntelliSense inside of my application, 
when I use your logging library and know which methods I can call and uh, with what arguments, what type it is, what, what return types I have and stuff like that. So it makes it easier for you to develop that library and for the others to consume that library. So basically, um, this is standard as well. And the Angular team came up and said, all right, we have to give that a headline. We have to give it a name um, of that format, that specific format Angular library should have. And they came up with the Angular package format, right? So the Angular package format is just a recommended way how Angular packages should be distributed. It's a file and a, a metadata structure, and it should support various formats. And it's also um, the format of the Angular core packages. So if you're consuming Angular core, Angular um, router, and all, all the kind of things you have inside of your Angular library, they are all built by this Angular package format. The Angular package format is a public uh, document, which you can Google at it's, it's um, version 10 right now. I just checked it. So basically, this describes how uh, the, the file and folder structure is if you are developing an Angular library, which others in your company or by NPM, the whole world can like use after that. So first of all, what are the steps if we want to do, if we want to have code and we want to like transform it to an Angular library. So first of all, we have to inline all the templates. Right. This makes us e makes it easier for the out of time um, compilation and um, having like all the templates inlined. Although you have them separated in an HTML file, they all have to be inlined automatically, and um, then it gets easier to compile them. Then the NGC, the Angular compiler, just runs over it and just compiles them, and the output should be like ESM 2015, which is ECMAScript 6, basically, and UMD, which is the universal module definition, which is AMD and CommonJS. So this is basically what gets spit out at the end if you are working with the Angular package format. But you don't have to do all of this by yourself. You don't have to inline the template manually, like do an NGC um, command over it, and then, then see what's, what's getting spit out. This is all being done for you by a package which is called ng packager and the ng package is included in the angular cli for you so uh, you don't get in touch with this or you get slightly in touch with this but it's included in the angular cli and we have various commands where we can just uh, work with um, the ng packager here is a screenshot of a basic library if you're doing a library and you build it in the angular package format this is how it looks like right so uh, you have a bundles folder you have the esm 2015 folder you have the pheasm 2015 folder, which is just the flat um, ESM 2015. It's just like one file. You have the library, you have the d.ts files, uh, you have a readme, um, you have a package.json and all the files you need just to, um, to work with that library, basically. The ng packager can also be configured when you're working on the library. And um, the very important property here is the entry file, which is the public-api.ts. And this is kind of like describing the interface where you as a consumer, when you're consuming all the code inside of that library are talking to. So you're not reaching into that library directly, you're reaching to that public API file. And everything the public API file exports, you can import, right? So here we are just, this is a public API file from like a library and we are exporting like a service, a component and a module from that particular library. And then it can be imported. Import my first module from my lib. And we will get to that um, now, just uh, diving a little bit deeper, just in a few moments. Of course, we can import multiple things we're exporting from that library. That is um, totally possible. What is being done if you're adding a library into your project is that this mylib path is going to be searched in the tsconfig.json. So every time you're importing from a specific string, what TypeScript does is it checks this paths array in the tsconfig in your Angular CLI file. We will get to that later if we're creating libraries and stuff. And if he finds that path on line 19, he will use basically that um, reference in this mylib lib to consume all the files. And if it does not fire the string you're importing from, it will look at the known modules, right? So basically it's just, if, if you import from my super duper lib, it searches that paths. And after that, it searches for uh, the node modules. I want to stick a little bit to the public API file. It's just uh, very, very important if we are building libraries. So this part is like 
uh, this part is about understanding the public API file. So basically it's about what you export and what you import and how you import it. Um, based on my experience, this has uh, some developers struggle with that. I see a lot of uh, customers struggling with that. So this is why I dedicate a small part of, of, of this uh, presentation to understanding the public API file. Just consider you have like an ng module and it declares a component. Um, uh, it's an XYZ module and you have that my component inside of that uh, module. You just declare it. If you import the XYZ module from that particular folder um, and you have like your application, you can use that component normally or you would think you would use that component, but this is not possible if you only declare it in a module. Like this is not a library, this is only an application. You have a, a, a module and you declare on my component and want to use it outside of that module. This is not possible because you have to add it to the exports array. So what Angular does here with ng modules is that it gives you kind of an abstraction on the module layer saying, okay, this information are private and what you want to share with the outside world, you have it to the exports array. I think we've all run into this issue if you want to use a component which does not get exported from the XYZ module in that case. And it's basically the same with libraries, um, but we have like this public API file, TS, um, which is standing in front, but basically it's the same. So if we have that component again, and this XYZ module, and we are building it in a library now, and we're going into our app module and we import the XYZ module from that library now, we have also that public API file from that library. And we can only import the XYZ module from that library if we export that XYZ module in the public API file. Because what this from lib does it, it refers to that public API file. So only if the public API file, the public API TS exports, this particular module, we can import it in our application and then we can use that my component. What we could do is now we could uh, go to go to the uh, assumption that we also can import the my component from that particular library because it's declared, it's exported in the Angular module, which we can see on the right hand side, it's in the exports array. And we can import that type in the import statement in the ECMAScript 6 import statement. So we import the XYZ module and my component from lib, which we would not do in this case, but basically we, we just can go to the, the ID and import that type. And this would basically not work. Why wouldn't that work? Because the type of the my component, not the component itself, it is in the exports array, but the type of my component does not get exported from the public API file. So what we could do to make this import statement work is we can export the component type as well. And then we can import um, the component for whatever re reasons we would do that. Maybe it's a modal component or something like that. And then we can import the type, right? The same is, um, or almost the same is with services. So we have services in Angular. Um, you know that we can add them to the providers array of a specific module. This is also inside of a library. And again, we're exporting um, the module from the public api.ts file. And then we're importing the XYZ module from the library. You know, providers are getting merged. So if we import that module, we are also providing the service. And then we could potentially go and use that service inside of our component, which would basically work. But the import statement of the type, again, import my service from Lib does not work. Why does it work? Um, why does it not work? Because we did not export the type specifically from the public API.ts file. So if we export, now the type of service, we can import the service again, and then everything would work um, like usual. Now we can use services also with the provided in syntax. I'm sure you have seen that. So with the provided in syntax, um, we are providing it at the root injector and Angular itself decides where to put the service if modules are lazy loaded. And again, here we have like the same problem. So we can't use the import my service from lib because we're not exporting the type. So if we're exporting the type again, then we can import it and use the type. And then um, TypeScript knows, or VS Code knows with IntelliSense, how you got this, this and that methods on that service and you can use it. So as a rule of thumb, you can, you can always keep in your head, if you import from a library via ECMAScript 6 import statement, 
the thing you import must be part of the entry file. It must be part of the public API file. Otherwise, you can't use the type from the outside, right? This is just the behavior of ECMAScript 6 modules and the abstraction, which we're getting between the logic we encapsulate and where we want to use it, basically. If you want to generate a library inside of your Angular CLI, you can easily do that um, with ng-generate library and then the name of your library, mylib in this case. So this triggers all the um, creation stuff and the scaffolding stuff, uh, which the ng-packager and the Angular CLI provide you. It's just an ng-generate library, mylib, right? So if you're into an Angular CLI project, just type that and you can start encapsulating logic into that library particularly. What I, would, what I would recommend is if you're working with the CLI and you're starting new, I would like, I would do an ng new, um, like a demo repo in this case, and then put the create application equals false behind it. What that does is it doesn't create you write an application to your um, Angular CLI workspace, but it uh, offers you like a workspace. So what it does is it's just like a, a, a basic files, like a shell where you can add applications and where you can add libraries for it. And this gives, this gives you like a, a folder and a, uh, and a better understanding of what your application consists of if you're working with multiple applications and multiple libraries. Because after this, you can do ng-generate app and then basically add your app and ng-generate your library and then all your libraries. And this is how it looks like. So inside of your Angular CLI, you don't have the application on root level. You have a projects folder and underneath that, you have all the projects your Angular workspace consists of. So if you have like a, a larger application, this is a very, very nice way to see what your application really consumes, where your libraries are, how they are, how they are um, used and how they're named and stuff. And it gives you a better overview of what your Angular application really, really consists of. The library, if you're just looking at the library, is exa exactly the files we just uh, have been taking a look at. So you have that public API file, all the tests are getting set up for you, or the, um, the ng-packager with the ng-packager JSON. We have seen the configuration file. It's uh, everything is set up for you. So basically the ng-generate uh, command really, really does the scaffolding and everything you need if you want to start uh, adding libraries to your project. I myself, I'm running a, a library on, on GitHub. It's about Angular authentication and, um, and tokens and Open Connect and stuff. So we're having such a workspace where we have like multiple test apps and one library, just one workspace, and then we can test our library against that specific applications or applications against the new version of the library and see if everything is working. So that's pretty neat. Of course, you cannot just generate libraries inside of an Angular CLI workspace. You can also build them and you build and then the name of your library, which puts them into the distribution folder in the Angular package format. So you see, you don't have to do anything here of the steps, but this is basically what's running behind. And you can also add watch on it. So if you change files and um, you can develop them side by side. So you have your library here, you can save the file, it gets rebuilt and then you consume it in your Angular application and you can, can just develop and um, it can develop your app and your library in parallel. So that's no problem at all. And this is a dist folder, uh, which we have seen in the beginning, everything um, gets put out from the uh, build command from the Angular CLI. So you don't have to worry about anything if you're uh, extracting code into a specific library. Of course, you can also lint your library, uh, see if it sticks to some rules, we'll get to that later. Uh, you can also test your library running the distributed test, like I mentioned in the beginning. You can also test with the CI with the watch equals false. So then you can run tests on your continuous integration and continuous delivery environment um, and just let them run one time and not watching for file changes. Let's stick to the linting a bit. Let's, let's lose um, some words about uh, quality, the quality of your um, library. You always have to think about if you're developing a library, whether it's on GitHub, whether it's open source or whether it's only in your company, um, it should like fulfill some quality requirements. It should like uh, be readable, it should be maintainable. Maybe you're not the only one uh, maintaining this um, and, and looking at the code. So you should make, uh, make it as easy as possible for others to get into it and to maintain the code and to work with you on that um, particular library. 
And we know that there is a code formatter which you should really, really should pay attention to, which is called Prettier. So if you really want to consider um, like an, an code style of your application and your library, um, maybe you should give that, uh, this a try. It's really, really good and it, it gives you kind of a standard. You can uh, apply it if you if you save and then everything gets formatted. So what I'm doing here is um, I'm just like misformatting something. And when I just hit save, everything gets back to its normal state and everything looks fine. So this is, um, you can do what you want to if you're like into your own project, although you should of course pay attention to your code style and stuff, but it gets more and more important if you like separate things out where the others look at and where, where others have to work with. Uh, I mean, you want to have pull requests, you want to have uh, people helping you maintain that library. So you should make it as easy as possible. Another thing which is pretty neat is something is, is called Husky. It's got nothing to do with the doc except for the icon, but it's about like um, running pre-commit hooks. So you can run um, like linting or testing or something before you commit or before you push, before you make those git actions, which makes, uh, which makes it really, really easy to keep your uh, library in that code style you wanted to to not commit anything which does not build and stuff like that. You can put anything you want to in there. Uh, Husky is pretty good for that to run those pre-commit hooks. You can just um, give that hooks in a JSON format in your package JSON. You can do pre-commit, please run the test, pre-push, please run the test. And so you can make your library a little bit more secure and prevent it from, from being pushed um, some like content you do not want to have or which is misformatted or something. All right. So now we have our library, we have it distributed or we want to distribute it inside of a company or to GitHub or uh, wherever you wanted to. Um, if you want to use it afterwards, you distribute it and you want to use it, I would recommend um, to, do, to test it locally. We will, we will take a look on that next. But however, if you want to distribute it, you all know NPM, this is a public source. You can always also have a private NPM server inside of your company. But if you wanted to uh, put it to NPM, you first have to, to see if several, several things work, if it's really, really good and uh, you can really, really use it the way you want to use it from the outside, right? If your interface is correct and all that kind of stuff. So what you can do is locally on your, you can start a new Angular CLI project. And when your lib is ready and it's built and it's in the distribution folder, you can use that NPM CLI to install it from that specific folder. So you can do NPM install and just go to the dist folder then, the path of your dist folder where the Angular package format lives and then press enter. And then you install it basically from that folder and you can test if your library works as expected. Right, so this is a pretty pretty good way to test if everything works like you wanted to. Of course, you can also use the link command, so you can do npm link and my lib, and then the distribution folder. I found it a little bit shaky when I'm working with the npm link command. It was not always getting the latest versions and stuff, but you can give it a try. Um, maybe it works better for you as it worked for me. What I would recommend is I would use the uh, npm pack command, and the npm pack command is basically you're, you're using it just to pack your application into a tarball file, a TGZ file, which is going to be created for you. And then you can install that particular TGZ file. So this is as close as you can get to the distribution format, which you will put to NPM or which you will put to uh, maybe your internal NPM server or whatever server you will want to put it on, right? So the NPM CLI is um, really, really mighty and you can do a lot of things with it also locally on your um, uh, local and um, developer environment, right? If you want to deploy the library then to the outside world, you can do this, uh, of course, to NPM, but you can also use an alternative, which is called Vedaccio. Vedaccio is kind of like a local NPM server where you can distribute to. Um, it's a lightweight NPM server, and uh, it's just a registration where you can add packages to. Um, so this one is running on local host, and maybe this is something for your company. You just can, for you and your colleagues, you can add some um, packages there, and then you can install it from there. So that's totally fine. It's not that heavyweight, uh, like NPM, maybe. Maybe this is something for you. Of course, your Angular library also needs some metadata. If you're making it open source and if you're pushing it to NPM, um, we have the dependencies, you have the peer dependencies, what your, what your library really needs. You have a name, of course, which we'll get to a little bit later, but I want to focus 
um, on the version next. So the version is really, really important because other developers rely on that, right? So for the version, always use the semantic versioning. So keep always keep in mind which number to increase. Uh, this is major, minor, and patch. So if you just have some patches and not um, adding or reducing some functionality, you just increase the latest number. Uh, if you have like changes, new features, like minor features, which you want to add, which has no breaking changes, then you increase the middle number. And if you have a major change, which has breaking changes, uh, you increase the major number. So people rely on it. So if I'm updating uh, the package if for a customer, I really, really look at the version and I really, really look at, is it, can I just include it and um, just maybe pay lower attention to what changed? Or do I have a major change and really, really the API changes, maybe it has breaking changes, right? So this is really, really important. Also, if you publish your library to NPM, pay attention to the name. So maybe in this case, something like Angular Rating or My Super Duper Logger or something is already taken. So on NPM, if you're going to NPM and want to publish your library there, what nobody can take away from you is your prefix based on your username. So you can do always at and then your username, which is at Fabian Gosebrink in this case, uh, slash and then the name of your library and you can really um, just publish libraries on NPM with that particular name um, as much as you want to because that name nobody can take that away from you because that's a safer name just to, to get your libraries up to NPM and if you want to do that if you just build your libraries um, you, you have an Angular CLI workspace and you have a library you have tested it locally and you have like all the code formats and all the style and everything works well you can publish it to npm right it's literally easy you just log into npm on the console this is being done by npm login i think and uh, then you can build your library uh, you add a readme you pay attention to the version and the name and then just hit npm publish and it's on npm right it's literally that easy you can always automate that if you want to and uh, yeah, then your API or your library is 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 uh, on NPM and consumable by the whole world. But um, I would like to give you in the next slide like uh, an advice which you really really should keep in mind before you publish your library to NPM. So be sure to remove all sensitive information before publishing. Nobody wants to see your credit card data. Nobody wants to see your passwords. Nobody wants to see files on NPM, which should not be there and stuff like that. So be sure to remove all sensitive information before publishing. Pay attention to double check it, triple check it maybe. And this is a really, really a good thing. Uh, it's better to double check it and then regret it afterwards. Okay. So great, now you have an Angular library, you've pushed it to NPM, you have separated logic, which others can consume, maybe inside of your company, maybe other colleagues are relying on the on your logging library and stuff like that. So, so things, are, uh, things are pretty clear for now, but um, by the time when we're working with Angular or large Angular applications, we are going more into the monorepository direction. And um, what the Angular CLI gives us is that workspace feeling, which is really, really good because we're not focusing on one application and one application only with some other stuff. We are focusing on the workspace with applications and libraries. But we have a company or we have tooling, a tool set, which goes a little bit further and gives us more things um, which we can consider when we're working with monorepositories. And this is Annex or uh, Narwhal. So the company behind this is um, Narwhal and they have the Annex tools, which you can use. And the Annex tools are basically sitting on top of the Angular CLI. They are like tuning the Angular CLI, give you another CLI where you can build uh, better workspaces with and uh, we can um, do have more separation and an easier separation of what your basic application consists of, right? So if you want to create an Annex workspace, what you can do is you can do NPM, NPX create Annex workspace at latest, which will pull the latest version for you and just scaffold the workspace for you uh, based on the latest versions uh, they published. And then we have the same workspace feeling as before. So this is kind of a kind of a workspace like a file and folder structure without any app or without any lib, like before with the projects folder. And then we can add like 
Angular apps or Angular libraries. You can also add like backend things in there. They, it it, it um, is not just about Angular. It's also about um, uh, you can add uh, React apps, you can add um, uh, Node apps, you can add Next, I think, and stuff like that. So you can add many apps, front end and back end, like in one repository. The advantage is that you have uh, like the versioning under control. Right, so you have one version for all your libraries and all the applications, and you know, and you can make sure that they all work together. Right, so inside of that workspace, you can ng nx generate Nawal Angular app, like my first, my second, my third app, and nx generate Nawal Angular library, and then the name of the library you want to add. And this is how a workspace basically looks like. So you can see we don't have that projects folder like the Angular CLI workspace has but we have um, the apps and the lips folders where the apps and the lips are also visually separated, right? And this gives you a, a, a huge control over, okay, I've got those apps inside of my workspace. Maybe you've got multiple ones and you have those libraries inside of that workspace. And this is a pretty, pretty neat way to keep uh, control over your architecture, over your maybe growing, growing, growing huge Angular applications and your huge architectures you can build with Annex. But if we're coming to Annex, um, we have to rethink libraries a little bit. Because right now we have in mind that if we have a feature and we take that feature, we separate it into a library and we're good to go. Right, and th this is true. Um, there's there's no doubt about that. But in an Angular workspace, if we are really want to separate a feature into um, libraries in an Annex workspace, it gives us the pos possibility. In Angular, what we're doing is we're doing one feature in four libraries. Right, we're not doing one feature in one library. We've taken a feature and we can put it in four basically libraries. The reason behind this, I will get to that later. However, if we're taking one feature, like uh, we have like an admin feature or a dashboard feature, or you have like a profile feature, we, the user can see his profile. It's just a lazy loaded module and you're showing some components and some services and you have a data access and all that kind of stuff. So in an Annex workspace, we're going ahead and we're building a feature library, which is also only consumed by one application and we're dividing that feature into a feature library which is basically holding the module we are routing to so this one is lazy loaded and holds all the container components right so this is what we're lazy loading the next library we are we are uh, um, creating is the ui library for that particular feature so this is what an, a feature also consists of the ui library holds all the all the presentational components for that particular feature, right? So all the, the uh, components with the input parameter where we just pass data in and they just take care about how the, the data should be displayed and not where the, where the data is coming from, right? So we have the feature um, library, which is um, the uh, container components. We have the UI library, which is for the presentation of components. What we also have is a data access library. So the data access library is like talking to an external API, like could be a REST API and just getting the data. And what we also have is like, maybe have is like a utils library if you need in that particular feature uh, kind of utilities, which, which are just shared over that feature, right? So this these four libraries are taken to display one feature if we're getting to an Annex mono repository, right? And I would like to show you, not in a demo, but I would like to show you a workspace um, I'll just make it a little bit smaller, you can see it. So there you go. Here we have, I will make it a little bit bigger. Hopefully you can see it. So right, right. So here we have um, an Annex workspace, which I created. It's based on the latest tool set. Uh, it's got prettier setup for you automatically. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, you see a file which is called Annex JSON, which holds all your projects which you have been adding and some other stuff um, which is not that important for the beginning. Of course, you have that package JSON where you can add your scripts. We will get to that later on, but I want to um, go more into that apps and the libs here. So what you can see is that we have an application which is called My App, uh, also the My App E2E, so the end to end. Um, testing application is also being created for you. But inside of that library um, or lips folder, um, what we do is we are not 
getting the libraries flat in there. But if I want to, to create a feature, which is called like profile, which is just where I click on and I see my picture and I can update my information and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm underneath that profile. So this is a folder. This is not a library. This is just a folder. And this profile folder holds a utils library, which is a library um, like we have seen before with all the commands we're using just for testing and not karma like the Angular CLI does. We're using ESLint. And we have a data access library, we have a profile feature library, we have a UI library, and we have a utils library, right? So these four libraries are building up a feature, a feature that I can use. And the profile feature basically is the one which holds like the uh, container components. I've not added some components right here, but this holds the container components, which I can route to in my app. So in the routing configuration of my app, I would just include that uh, particular library uh, based on the path. So if you add a library with the annex commands, we can do this if you want to. So what we can do is um, I would like to just like this. We're here. So we can annex generate novel Angular library. Let's call it uh, test lib or something. Test lib and I want to put it into a directory directory which is called test directory All right and just press enter and hopefully this works I can now see I want to use access and then the library gets created for me you can see in the lib we have a test here and then there is test lib and the library got created for me right what also was created inside of the TS config, you can see this paths array here, exact the same way as the Angular CLI does it. Uh, this is the same uh, technique behind it. So here we have like the path where we import from. So now if we are really importing from a specific library, we do not reach into that library, into a source folder, any source related lib source or dot dot slash lib source and stuff like that. We always refer to that particular path. Right, so if we want to like import the feature module uh, from the profile, we have a profile feature here. We can go into our app and then we go into our app module and we do, um, I would like to see if Visual Studio Code now fools me again because Visual Studio Code sometimes tries to fool you. If I take that profile feature, um, profile, profile feature module where well, the naming is pretty bad, but you got the idea and I import it to that module here, it gives me that light bulb, but this is not the path we want to refer to, right? So this is not the path you want to consume libraries from. The real path is down here in the TS config, and we know that my workspace profile profile feature, and we take this one, so this would be the right path for it. And you can see that it's also known. We got that profile feature and this path here, the My Workspace profile feature is referring into that library to that we have the index.ts file here, which was the public API file, basically technically it's the same. So we have the export from and then the feature module and this is what we're referring to. This gives us the abstraction of the code which is hidden behind that library and where we are talking to as a consumer. Right, so don't let Visual Studio Code fool you and when we're talking about that. Right, um, so of course we can also um, just display shared information or um, get shared libraries to work if we're doing a folder shared and then we can place a shared uh, functionality in there. Um, but you can see how easy it is to create libraries and don't be afraid to create a lot of libraries. This is what we're, this is what we are building this for and this is why we're using the inside of our Angular JSON, you can also see that the project is getting updated automatically for you. So you can always see what project your application or your workspace consists of. You can see the name of the projects here. What you can also do in the Annex JSON, you can give those libraries tags and those applications tags. And with those tags, you can uh, maintain or you can control the architecture. So maybe I have a tag here, which is called lib profile utils and this is um, a lib profile feature so we can do this lib profile feature what the linter can do for me is 
the linter ESLint RC, you can see you have those depth constraints here. And with those tags, you can always refer to those tags and you can say this tag, like, I don't know, a tag which I just gave, like a lib, a lib1, can only depend on libraries with tags lib, lib2, if you want to. Of course, you have to provide the tags. But this is kind of like an architectural, um, architectural guidance and architectural helper telling you if you uh, have a new developer in your team or you, you're making wrong imports or something and they just consume a wrong library, which they should not refer to. Basically, the linter tells you that when you lint and says, hey, you're referring to something which you should probably not do. So this is a level of security you have inside of, of your Annex uh, monorepo and in the Annex workspace. It really, really helps maintaining an architecture and building your architecture with the um, way we building the libraries inside of that Annex monorepo. So this is really, really, really mighty. I would, I would really recommend to use this. So you can keep control of what depends on what inside of your workspace. All right. Having that said, why are we doing so much libraries? Why are we building up a feature, not only in one feature, but doing like four libraries for it, right? Um, I want to get to that next. Because Enix um, provides us something which is called the uh, affected commands, or you can, um, you can type in affected commands. And what they do is Enix can see which files are affected by the changes you are doing on your specific branch or pull request. So it only rebuilds and relints and um, tests or retests the files or the libraries you made changes to and which are relying on that. And if you're making more and smaller libraries and having a great architecture, it really, really reduces your build time when you're having a continuous integration and continuous delivery environment. So really, really get down the time. You don't have to build everything all the time, but maybe you're just doing something on a small library only like one app just refers to. Then only the library and the app has to be rebuilt. And those affected commands can be used. And if you're having a great separation with those libraries on that, um, on that level, then the affected, uh, affected commands really, really come into play and can really, really help you uh, maintaining your architecture and maintaining only um, building, testing, linting, what you really change, right? Um, what they also have is like caching and a depth graph. So the caching is when you're locally running a command and you're running it again and the files didn't change, again, they're checking if the files have been changed or not, uh, you're getting the cached uh, results. So you don't have to run the test for a specific library again if you didn't change anything from the last run, right? What they also have is a dependency graph. And the dependency graph is can visually give you like information about your architecture. So this is a screenshot where you can see, okay, so this app, it's like a product app is based on the shared assets. It's based on that shared header and it lazy loads, which is the dotted line, the product's homepage and stuff like that. So I have found a lot of issues in my architecture just by saying, oh, why isn't that library lazy loaded? It should be lazy loaded basically, but it wasn't because I made a mistake and stuff. So you can really, really see what your architecture is like inside of that Annex monorepo and it comes, this command comes with it. You don't have to install any package for it or something. So this is really, really an um, advantage. I just talked about the dev rules. So um, the dependency rules is really, really good. You have that source tag only depends on libraries with tags. And then you can say, my app should only consume logging, notification and stuff. And um, what I've been saying also is that it um, relies on the latest tool set. So we, uh, Annex uses Cypress for end-to-end -end testing. It uses Jasper default free tests. Um, it uses ESLint if you're starting now, so you can choose between TSLint and ESLint. It uses ESLint now. Um, yeah, and all the latest stuff you can, Prettier is, is set up for you and all the latest stuff you can, you can basically think of, right? So this is really, really good. Uh, a really, really helper CLI and tool set to maintain um, bigger and growing Angular architectures, right? If you want to dive more into Angular libraries in particular, um, there's a Pluralsight course out there, which was made by a pretty, pretty cool guy, um, which you can uh, take a look at. This is about Angular libraries, how you can work with it in an Angular CLI workspace. If you want to dive more into the Annex monorepo thing, I can really, really recommend you this Enterprise Angular monorepo, monorepo patterns book. Um, 
it's a little bit old. It's from 2018, but it's really, really accurate still. And all those informations, which I just told you in a nutshell, are really, really in there. And you can, you can uh, read about it there. And um, yeah, this is when I'm coming to the end, when we're talking about architecting Angular apps with libraries. What we've taken a look at is um, how you can create Angular libraries and what they are built upon with the ng-packager, how you can use them inside of an Angular CLI workspace, how you can drive your architectures in an Angular CLI workspace, how you can distribute them, what you should pay attention to, and how we use them in an NX monorepo if you're having like a large Angular applications and large architectures to maintain. And all that um, just to do not repeat yourself, right? We don't want to repeat ourselves. We just want to extract it to libraries. But I want to come back to this because I started with this and I want to close my presentation with the uh, don't repeat yourself. Um, it's, it's totally okay to sometimes uh, do the DRY to do repeat yourself. Right. If you have a small method or a small function which you just can copy paste and it does its thing and it does its thing good, um, just copy paste it one time, copy paste it two times, it's okay. Just build that feature, move on, get that feature going. Right, This is what puts value. So do repeat yourself with caution. Of course, if it gets bigger, maybe a library should be considered and maybe you could talk to your colleagues and uh, maybe you should do a library then. You have seen how to do this now. So do repeat yourself with caution. And in the end, I just want to say thank you very much. Stay sane in that uh, crazy times and take care. Thank you very much for your attention.